Ethan, you're still holding Ooh. this mic in your hand. What on earth are you doing? <laughs> it you're, gives me you're a professional now. It gives me something for my hands to do, Camille. And uh, <laughs> as Charles Oakley once said to New York Knicks management when they were good, uh, to <laughs> the GM, if it ain't broke, don't break it. That's my philosophy. <laughs> but I mean, look, there's a chance. There's a chance that maybe if I go to the non-handheld, it will unlock a tier of podcasting yeah. that has previously not been accessible to me. But maybe I just always want that to be there, that that potential that sort of uh, I can make excuses for myself if I have this built-in disadvantage. Hmm. Yeah, because the secret to great podcasting is moving your hands when you talk, which I can do freely <laughs> without the microphone. If you were to do that, we would be able to hear you intermittently. So that wouldn't be yeah. so great. I mean, oh, it, it, look, it, look, you know what? I will take direction. I think you're right. Uh, <laughs> I will be a big boy about it. This is House of Strauss. We have Camille Foster on from the fifth column, but he's a guy who wears so many hats, Camille. I mean, yes. I... True Jamaican. Yeah. Many, many I, jobs. I, I mean, you're at Founders Fund and... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the rabbit hole I went down, Camille, is that, I mean, usually I try to, when prepping for a guest, listen to their podcasting, which is no bother at all because the fifth column's fantastic. But I Thank found you. myself in this rabbit hole of the dispatches from the well uh, oh, and you <laughs> traversing the planet asking all of these trippy cosmic questions. I, you know, I thought that we might get into the ugly, dirty, temporal realm of politics. Yes. So let's start, let's start it this way, Camille. Um, do you believe aliens exist? Let's start with that. I'm confident that there is other life out there beyond Earth. I am sure of it. Have they come mm. here? Are there UAPs? Did we did we find the the fully intact ships and pieces of ships and perhaps even alien cadavers? I am far more skeptical of that proposition. Okay. So my son every now and again asks me this. He's five. Yeah. He asks me whether aliens are real and what I think about it. How do I make the case to him? How do I make the case to a five-year-old Camille that there's plausible reason to believe they're out there. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If your five-year-old won't believe anything you say, I'm not sure I can help you make the case. Like, oh, this, no. this, they're too no, sophisticated. He, 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 it's not that. I mean, he, okay. he's just curious. He needs to know why. He okay. needs to, he's a Strauss, as, as <laughs> Anthony says. Um, how do I make the case for here is why I think aliens are out there? Because I want to believe, and I think he does too. Yes. I mean, time and the universe are vast beyond our our potential imagining uh, the, the likelihood that we would be the only life in the universe, the only outpost um, for matter that somehow becomes conscious and starts contemplating its own existence and the nature of the cosmos is just beyond imagining. Um, so I have to suspect if natural forces and laws, immutable laws of the cosmos help to bring about our existence, that it has done this in other places as well. And perhaps in other ways, it may even be the case that that life has evolved in such a way that we'll never, ever be able to interact with or even recognize that it's there. Uh, but it's mm. impossible for me to believe that the cosmos is just this empty canvas that happens to have this blip of life and consciousness um, on the planet Earth in some remote backwater of the, of the universe. <laughs> so I th there's there's someone yeah. else out there, you know? I, I'm with it. I mean, the other way to go with it, and I'm not smart enough to think through all the implications and the why okay. and why not, but there are a lot of people, I know smart people in my life. I know an NBA general manager, Camille, who <laughs> believes that we are in a simulation. He literally sure. believes that. Yeah. Where are you on that one? Uh, you know, simulation hypothesis doesn't do a lot for me because it doesn't actually answer the most important question. I mean, just like mm. someone who says, I have to believe in God because that tells me, you know, that that uncaused cause is the reason why we have a universe. Um, but how do we get to this uncaused cause? Like if you have to have a designer, then there must be another designer. Now, is it possible that we are, in fact, in some simulation and there is some grand designer? I suppose there is, but I don't see any more reason to accept that premise than to accept any number of other kinds of theological premises that that purport to suggest that, you know, there's uh, there's someone who made all of this. Um, 
I also don't know that it matters. I mean, it just doesn't mm. doesn't seem that it matters all that much to me. So it, it's not it is not a, a proposition that seems to add a great deal to our understanding. I feel the same way about uh, the hypothesis that there are many other universes, and in those universes, we're having some variation of this conversation. It, okay, maybe that's true, but by definition, I will never have access to that. We'll never have confirmation of that fact. I am not, I'm inclined not to think at, not not with <laughs> yeah. that attitude, Camille. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to think this is the one. Um, mm. And to the extent there are many, the most important question, and this is, I think, worth anyone thinking about who is a thoroughgoing materialist who kind of dis- dismisses faith um, in something bigger than ourselves. Like, where did the u- the laws of the universe that gave rise to all of the complexity and wonderfulness and sort of terrifying? insanity that we see around us, like black holes, for example, um, where did the rules come from? Mm. Why do they work? Uh, That's a pretty foundational question that seems like it deserves some contemplation. Um, The the fact that the universe exists is the first uh, miraculous thing. Um, The second miraculous thing is that it leads to all of us being here. And the third miraculous thing is that we're conscious and we're aware mm. of it, and we have the ability to contemplate it. Those three things um, can't be easily explained, and as a result, I mean, I think deserve far more of our attention than they than they get, and ought to fill us with a sense of awe and wonder, um, and on an ongoing basis. Uh, it certainly does that for me. That's what I love about your clips. It's the awe, the wonder, the fact that you are asking what is consciousness, which is a more slippery concept than I would have thought so intuitively, but I just yeah. loved watching you geek out on a baby bison <laughs> being born. Just yeah, experiencing the, yeah, yeah, experiencing the majesty of the universe with yes. uh, uh, placenta uh, before you, 15 <laughs> feet away, bison placenta, which I suppose they eat. I think that's what I was seeing in the video. And a lot of animals the, do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a source of nutrition. Uh, yeah. Nature is red and tooth and claw and, uh, <laughs> and whatever. delicious placenta. And, yeah. Yeah. Which I believe is red. <laughs> I need to check that later. I haven't yeah. had bison placenta yet, but, and then going <laughs> to the particle accelerator, it's just a great journey, man. I, I Thank you. also, I just like the way that your mind works. Some of the people listening will be very familiar. Other people won't. You're just one of the more idiosyncratic thinkers um, who is very hard to pin down to the chagrin of so many people who, who are trying to pin you down. But I, you know, I relate to how I feel like you're you're curious and you're looking at the world as a buffet. You're looking for thoughts and different thinkers. When you were sitting down with with Steve Albini, the great musician, mm. and Fred Armisen, and yeah. I, I don't know what their politics are. I feel like some of their thoughts and economics might not align with yours, but it doesn't matter. You're just looking, you're just looking for something. And yeah. I, I thought, I mean, this isn't even a question. I just really appreciate that. No, thank you so much, man. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you honestly, being able to do that project with the Templeton Foundation and my, my team over at Freethink um, was just a real privilege. It was a welcome reprieve from what I'm usually doing when I'm talking in public, uh, which is primarily talking about various political and cultural issues that perhaps intersect with politics. Um, and in truth, I mean, those things are important and consequential, but Most of the stuff that I do in public, even my kind of advocacy for an individualist centered um, philosophy and politics is uh, is in, I hope, in the direction of trying to get the species, our species Mm -hmm. to rally around this project of better understanding the cosmos and our place in it. I mean, it, it feels like the most important kind of work that we can do collectively um, it's it's the work of a lifetime. It's the work of countless lifetimes, perhaps. Um, and it's it's just so wonderful to think that you can participate in this continuum of human understanding built up over millennia, over generations, across cultures. It's just it's it's amazing. It's inspiring. And you know, we, do we argue and debate about the best way to live our lives, about the best system of government, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, sure. Um, but at bottom, if we understand that we're all caught up in this great mystery, as Jane Goodall described it, um, of existence here on Earth, 
this simultaneity mm-hmm. of our moment that we're sharing together, I think it makes it so much easier to approach those problems with kind of the appropriate level of seriousness, which is to say, not imagining that whatever political debate we're involved in is the most consequential thing in the world. I can completely relate to that. I'm wondering, at some point, Steve Albini said to you that he views himself as a vector of history. Mm. Given what you just said, do you relate to that or does that seem like too grandiose a way to live? No, I don't think it's too grandiose a way to live. Having having the sense that you can help to document, um, explain, uh, contribute to, to explain and contribute to our understanding collectively um, is, I think, not just appropriate, but important. Um, mm-hmm. I think it helps to, it helps to center, it helps to center you. Um, and that, that doesn't eclipse any of the other more personal, intimate things that I am engaged in, you know, the project of building a family with my wife, yeah. of raising our children together, um, of contributing to my community. Um, all of those things are important too, but I, I like kind of nesting it into something. Uh, I think it's become very popular, especially for very erudite materialists to imagine that there is no meaning to the cosmos, that there is no meaning mm-hmm. to all the, that we see around us, that eventually it ends. Um, perhaps, you know, the, the entropy runs its course and the universe just yeah. kind of blinks out into nothingness. Um, but there is inherent meaning in the whole thing. It's implicit. Yeah. It's subjective. It's unique to each and every one of us from our our particular vantage points and the story of the cosmos, whatever it is and whatever that means in its entirety is literally incomplete without your unique point of view. And yeah. having an awareness of that, um, I, I think is just so important uh, because it suggests that whatever you're going through, whatever you're enduring, it isn't meaningless. It means something to yeah. you. Um, and the things that are most important to you that you celebrate that make you happiest, you know, waking up and having your kid kick you in the head because they're sleeping in the bed, um, mm. is, is a gift, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I prefer to view it that way as well. And even if that is painful and my kid kicks me in the head, it is consciousness. <laughs> yeah. I, looking back, it's odd to me that the pandemic didn't inspire more of that thinking. And it's additionally so strange to me that the people who seemed most inclined to be fearful of losing their existence don't tend to vest much meaning in it. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an odd detour, but I'm just thinking now kind of free associating about how being confronted with this potentially deadly disease, um, potentially on an individual level, I'm not saying that the disease is, you know, it's up in the air as to whether it killed people, but you, you would have thought that it would have, it would have inspired more soul searching. And it was so strange to me that out of that, People generally, I I don't think we're asking those big questions. And I don't know what it is about our society right now, Camille. Look, you could say religion um, is insufficient or literally dogmatic. And there was a time back in the day where it was, hey, in these countries, you, you have to be Christian and this is the meaning of the universe. But people were wrestling and really trying to seek answers about what this all is. John Donne's poems, his writing, it's about what is this? It seems like that thinking is not present. What's up with that? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. I have a lot of complicated feelings about this. Um, I'll try to zero in on, on one or two things. I mean, first, it's easy to look back and to read kind of the great writers of a particular era and imagine that, a greater percentage of the population perhaps was engaged in this, in that great project that you Mm. describe understanding and contemplating the nature of their existence. But my suspicion is that most people throughout most of history who were living their kind of short, nasty, brutish lives um, in different contexts, kind of gave it some thought, but were busy trying to survive. Um, And that the great gift of being able to exist right now in this moment is that we have a lot more prosperity. We don't need to work nearly so hard. We don't spend nearly as much time mostly um, worrying about where our next meal is coming from. And as a result, we actually have the advantage of being able to think deeply about what's coming um, and about what we can do uh, collectively together and what it all means. Um, so I think that there's there's 
you know, maybe things aren't as bleak as they seem because someone is always engaged in that project, even if most of us aren't. But, you know, the Mm. pandemic was just such an extraordinary time. You have what is almost certainly for most people around the world simultaneously, like we're enduring one of the most extraordinary, strange and kind of horrifying experiences of our lives. And all of the things that we'd come to depend on, all the things that seemed normal, unraveled pretty quickly. And, yeah. you know, for most Americans, you know, you haven't, you didn't grow up in a war zone or anything like that. You've, you've had a, a pretty, a pretty good life. You know, whatever else might have happened to you, at least the, the role of the dice that, that led to your being kind of born into these circumstances, pretty good. Um, I think it got pretty dark for a lot of people. And I've been astonished to see that in some instances, it led to people becoming much better people and developing Mm. a better sense of what matters. And in other instances, it's really scrambled people's circuits and it's led them to look for simple answers, even if they're simple answers and simple imperatives um, that lead them to mistrust their fellow man and imagine that people who disagree with them are the worst kinds of monsters and to even embrace a kind of secular fundamentalism in certain instances uh, that makes it easy to dismiss um, (laughs) everyone else who isn't part of the team um, and to even punish in the most severe potential ways um, people who kind of deviate from accepted beliefs. Uh, so it's, it's a really complicated picture, but coming out of the pandemic, certainly like the project that I was doing for Templeton, I mean, I think it, it arrived at the right time. I was thinking about a lot of those things anyways, mm. both because I was a still somewhat new dad at that point. Um, but also because we'd just gone through something extraordinary. And we'd all kind of lost something and we all had a sense perhaps uh, in a little bit more of an acute way about the kind of temporality of things, um, about our vulnerability to, you know, the vicissitudes of life. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I feel, I feel more in touch with myself. You know, if someone asks me what the meaning of life is, I can at least provide my own um, Mm -hmm. and it may or may not satisfy them, but it certainly satisfies me. Yeah. And I think, you and I relate to the idea of how invariant it all was back then in a way that we're almost in denial of. I think mm-hmm. maybe it's so uncomfortable. That's why creeping determinism is a thing where we try to come up retroactively with the yeah. idea that whatever happened was inevitable and predictable when back then during that time, it was so turbulent and just it felt like there were no laws and God knows what might happen? Well, okay, so here's something. I said, God knows. Camille, you grew up religious. Are you coming back to God or did you ever leave? That's a big question. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm not, let me put it this way. I, I did grow up in a, a very evangelical family um, and household for most of my childhood anyways. Um, I was a Seventh-day Adventist. It was hard to miss a Saturday um, of church. Mm-hmm. Uh, but somewhere along the line in college, I got to the point where I realized that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. And certainly sitting through my first Jewish studies course and being confronted with the biblical redactor, um, theory, like after having been, you know, growing up in a house where I was told that this is the inerrant word of God and that Mm. all of the, the basic instructions before leaving earth, like this is the book that contains it it forced me to, to think um, a little bit more critically about things. Not that I didn't have questions before that experience. Um, so I kind of moved away from the traditional packaged um, faith uh, belief systems. Uh, but I think what, where I am now um, is probably just someone who is intensely curious about all of the things, who is constantly struck by the remarkableness of the, the kind of pure givenness of our existence here, and my time here. And um, it's it's hard not to attribute some an inherent virtue to all of it. And I'm well mm. aware of the fact that there is suffering in the world and has been profound suffering throughout time, species blinking in and out of existence, et cetera, et cetera. Even so, in the present moment, there's just something so rich about yeah. existing um, that it's hard not to attribute it to something. Now that's something for me is it a person? It seems a bit too reductive. You know, is it someone who has a particular concern uniquely for earth? I mean, if they do, they have a weird way of showing it. 
I think what I'm inclined towards is what Einstein described as Spinoza's God and this notion of kind of all of the things in the natural world, all of the things in existence being that thing that we would describe as God to the extent we're going to use a word for it. Whatever word it is, is inadequate. Um, and to know that I'm a part of it and you're a part of it and we have that in common, there's just something really rich about that understanding and about a, a perspective and approach to the world that that includes that. I think it's, for me, it just, it feels healthier. I feel better <laughs> um, mm. endorsing that point of view. And I think it's far better than kind of the standard materialist uh, suggestion, which is, you know, at some point, everything blinked into existence, it evolved in some sort of way, and the unconscious matter somehow spontaneously became conscious. But oh, yeah, your consciousness is kind of an illusion and not really a thing. Um, just deal with it. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah. there's, it, it just doesn't, it, it seems inadequate. And it could be because yes. my primate brain just can't process it, which is fine. You know, I don't expect <laughs> to be able to understand everything the same way my, my dog doesn't understand calculus. But um, it seems obviously inadequate in important respects. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I mean, and what is, why do I think something's out there? Um, how, is it because I thought deeply about it? No, though I might have on occasion. It's, I was driving down the backside of the Berkeley Hills one day with my son in the back of the car and it was a sunny day. We were on Wildcat Canyon Road, um, which has been closed due to mudslides. Incidentally, uh, in perpetuity, uh, just the whole thing is covered in red tape. God knows when it'll be opened up. But uh, I was just driving down the backside of the hills, and there are so many trees. It's beautiful in the Berkeley Hills. And the sun was shining, and it was shining on my, my son's face. And I just thought to myself, mm. I just had this powerful feeling of, I don't think this is all random. I don't think we're just bags of chemicals and this is all just arbitrary. I believe there is something there. There is a hand in all of this. Could I defend that to Richard Dawkins? Uh, <laughs> probably not. If he started to interrogate me, I don't think I could come up with a uh, an articulate rebuttal as to why my perspective is what it is. And yet it is what it is. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, that that language and perhaps even reason may fail us as we try to approach the ineffable <laughs> mm -hmm. is not so surprising. It's just something you feel that you kind of know in your gut that you that you see in your happiest moments um, when you're feeling particularly inspired. Uh, the word transcendence springs to mind here. It, mm. You just know it. You just know that there's something important and consequential and meaningful taking place here. And I think in our best moments, like we feel that and, and we know it deep down in our core. And again, to, to suggest all of this doesn't immediately suggest that there is a very clear system of, of philosophical beliefs that go along prepackaged with that or theological propositions that are prepackaged with that, that you must live in this particular way in order to satisfy the divine. Um, I mean, I think those those um, innovations and be generous in the way I describe it um, are, are what they are. You know, some of that stuff will work for you and some of it won't, but the more fundamental idea that we're here and that it isn't meaningless because you bring meaning to it um, mm. is, is just a, a vitally important thing for us to have and hold on to, especially in an age where, where we don't have the same relationship with the kind of traditional myths that we might be introduced to as children um, or that we might encounter uh, in in kind of seminary or in our, our church services. Um, I I don't know if it connects to a quote from uh, the filmmaker Godfrey Reggio when you're interviewing him, mm. but it gave me something to draw off. Uh, I liked when he said, "Our behavior determines the content of our minds." Absolutely. That was something yeah. that made an impression on me. This idea that. Um, what you do in the world does matter. It doesn't just matter in what you do in the world, but it matters internally. Um, I mean, I, 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 this isn't even a question. It's just I felt like that was a very good quote and something valuable that I took from the series that you did.
Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad it resonated with you. Um, I, I really do hope more people check it out and making it was a labor of love. The best part about it is reading the comments, which, mm. you know, I do a lot of stuff in media. There are often, there's often feedback. Plenty of times there are people who are enthusiastic. Oftentimes there are lots of people who kind of hate me for having the wrong yeah. kinds of ideas about something. Um, in this particular instance, far fewer bits of kind of negative feedback and far more um, instances of me getting notes and seeing comments from people who say, thank you. This is like the best thing I've encountered all day. This made me feel mm. so good. I really needed this today. Um, and, you know, to the extent that just being thoughtful and contemplative and curious about um, the the nature of the gift of existence and consciousness um, is beneficial to people, then that's that's great. I mean, it just makes me more optimistic about the prospects for the species. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, Thank you. let's try to, let's try to speed run your intellectual journey because you, you are doing <laughs> a million things and I've got to watch sports talking, sports TV, talking heads debate Brock Purdy. So we both have our things we have to rush off to. Um, so, you know, you mentioned having that religious background, coming to college, having your mind opened up. Am I wrong to assume that the the economist Hayek was one of these figures for you that opened things up? Uh, and why, if I'm correct in that assumption? No, you're not wrong about that at all. Um, I, I think my own uh, philosophical journey when it comes to kind of my ideas about politics, et cetera, um, really began to take shape uh, when I encountered Bastiat's book in college. And I, I have a hard time remembering even how I found my way to it. But I, I distinctly remember the feeling I had when I first started reading those words. And I believe the opening lines were, the law perverted, it's kind of all in caps with an exclamation mm. point, and the police powers of the state perverted along with it. It's kind of a shocking way to be introduced to these ideas of classical liberalism, the notions of mm. limited government, of a government that isn't um, as Kennedy described it, something that you should be, um, that you should have a relationship with that's, that's kind of servile in some respects. Mm -hmm. Ask not what your country do, can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Um, and interestingly, my transition from Bastiat was probably the next thing I read was like Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. And in that book, he directly looks at this Kennedy, um, speech and this idea that I was pretty, pretty, committed to. Like it felt like the right way to think about things. Um, but Milton's perspective was that that neither aspect of what Kennedy was suggesting or neither option of what he suggested were the right ways to think about um, our, the relationships of a free person and a free society with the state. Um, that it isn't so much about what you can do for your country or what the country can do for you. It's what we can do collectively as individuals to, to create uh, a, poly, a polity and uh, to establish a kind of politics or at least political order that allows us all to pursue our several ends. Um, and the reason for doing that is described so well by Hayek's work, um, which in a nutshell suggests that there is this there is this distribution of knowledge about the way that the world works. And the only way to fully leverage all of the knowledge that's out there is to allow markets to operate, to capture the details of what people know about various industries, about particular trends, and to, to allow prices to kind of transmit information across the economy and bring about um, a, a system whereby we're, we're seeing growing prosperity, more and more wealth being created, um, and more and more kind of products and services being created to, to satisfy the needs of different people all over the world. Um, so I think that they have kind of a, a, those ideas had a, an extraordinary impact on me generally and are still quite persuasive to me today um, and inform you know, my, my approach to, to politics in general. Well, I'm wondering if you can reconcile that freedom loving individualistic approach with some of the chaos that you see now that you've moved <laughs> to the bay area we were <laughs> we were at a dinner uh yeah. we were at, at ramen shop in oakland on college avenue it's a very nice uh part of oakland but any part <laughs> of oakland you have it in the back of your mind that your car might get broken into 
And I remember during the dinner, you and I were both going, eh, should we, you know, you, you, especially you had your head on a swivel. Um, <laughs> I don't spend much that, time in Oakland. That's the issue. The, there's this sense and there's this sense of, wait a second, am I being paranoid? You know, am I being, am I being soft and, and, and just flinching for no reason? And I can't remember what we left it at, but when we left, our cars were fine. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all fine. Proving that we were paranoid, except wrong, completely <laughs> incorrect. The very next night, the very next night, so we missed it by a night. Uh, a tweeter puts out this. This was literally the night after we went to dinner at Ramen Shop. Craziness in Oakland. Pulled up to Ramen Shop on College Avenue this evening <laughs> for dinner in Rockridge. As soon as we got out of the car, loud noises and horns were coming from across the street at the Trader Joe's parking lot. A car was driving through the lot with numerous people bipping cars. Onlookers honked and yelled, and at one point, the car with the culprits jumped the island and ran into a small tree. The cars then proceeded to slowly drive north on College Avenue with the doors open while at least three people dressed in all black masks and headlamps checked car by car on both sides of the street, breaking windows as they went. The car pulled up right next to ours. One of the bippers looked in right at us and went on to break into two cars in front of us. <sighs> People were on the street taking videos, yelling at them to get the fuck out of there. And on their phones, presumably calling 911, the culprits didn't care and leisurely walked in the middle of the street and in front of traffic. Absolute madness. Uh, mayor says the, the mayor says the, that Oakland is safe. Uh, woof is the, uh, the last, uh, <laughs> I didn't stick the landing on that narration. <laughs> frankly, frankly, if I'm totally honest, I was afraid how to pronounce the mayor of Oakland's name. Um, That's fine. It, 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 so I just tried to turn it into mayor, got caught up in the air. Uh, how do you reconcile that sort of chaos, Camille, with this, uh, you, you want maximal freedom. Is it easy <laughs> to reconcile? Is it hard to reconcile? What's I think it's take? pretty. I think it's pretty easy to reconcile because, again, my, my predisposition is now well understood, hopefully, at least a little bit. Um, but I don't see the, the freedom prevailing <laughs> here in the Bay Area, um, certainly not in Oakland. There are all sorts of odd provisions that exist there. And for me, freedom means something very particular. I mean, there's a kind of order. Um, as a result of the just system of laws that protect people's private property. This is a very fundamental thing. Um, and in a place like Oakland, it seems like that essential function that government is supposed to um, actually deliver is mm -hmm. among the things that government is least capable of delivering in Oakland. Um, when mm -hmm. I have been there, the few times I get there, and I try not to go too often, um, I am always struck by the number of stores that I walk into that have signs that say things like, we no longer accept cash because we keep getting mm -hmm. robbed. Um, like That's no way to live. And it is a bizarre mm -hmm. thing to have in a, in a first world country. And I certainly see the media reports, although fortunately it doesn't happen anywhere near me, of people who like take over a street and have some sort of weird like drag racing or car show type situation out of the Fast and the Furious. And the police just never show up and all kinds of chaos takes place. I think that is far less um, consistent with the, the kind of freedom um, that I am interested in. And I think a lot of the dysfunction um, here in this particular area can, can be traced, can be traced back to that. So do you think it's traced back to uh, the government in Oakland or the state indulging that sort of chaos or protecting that kind of chaos? Is that I the perspective that I'm divining? Undoubtedly, that's undoubtedly part of it. And I think it's also a, res a reflection of the the prevailing philosophical and political ethos here. I mean, there are a lot of people who were very enthusiastic uh, in 2020 when folks were taking up the mantra uh, that we should defund the police, for example, just get rid of them. Uh, I am certainly a, a very thoroughgoing libertarian. There are all sorts of things that I think the police shouldn't do, but whether or not I think there should be some sort of law enforcement function that, again, is doing things like enforcing property rights, ensuring yeah. that no one is kind of clubbed over the head and um, taken advantage of in various ways, like that's actually pretty important. And yeah. that probably ought to be funded. And even if I were to indulge my um, my most heretical, 
not heretical, perhaps heretical is the right word, my most heretical beliefs um, that we achieve some sort of nosic like um, minimal state. Um, or, <laughs> like that's still something that I expect to be done. Like basic police powers deployed to protect people so that they can actually live their lives and have a degree of confidence that they won't be taken advantage of by their fellow human. And if they do, that they'll have some meaningful recourse yeah, without, having too, to, without having to draw their own yeah. firearm and take care of it themselves. Yeah, I, I too agree that crime should be illegal. Uh, I, I do have that <laughs> crazy, crazy belief. Um, I mean, what do you say to, you know, kind of a general take a rebuttal to more libertarian minded uh, perspectives might be that, look, this sort of stuff that works well for smart people and highly self-sufficient people, but not everybody's like that. There is a great mass of people, perhaps the people you referenced earlier are leading these nasty, brutish lives who need more scaffolding and need to be told what to do. What would you say in response to a broad critique like that? Uh, I'd say that historically the state hasn't done a great job of telling people what to do and that a lot of utopian mm -hmm. schemes that hoped that the state would be able to deliver all of the most essential things to everyone um, haven't worked out particularly well. Uh, and that at a minimum, the, the best case scenario for, for anyone who has that aspiration is you probably have to look at some of the European states and even the ones that are often celebrated as being uniquely socialist have a hell of a lot of market qualities built into them. They allow mm -hmm. for a great degree of freedom. And um, among the things that I'm most interested in from a public policy standpoint, I mean, there are a lot of libertarians and classical liberals who agitate for things like licensing reform, for example. They want to make it easier for people to, to do jobs in cosmetology, to, 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 to cut hair, to open a lawn care business, for example. Um, and the fact that we have erected so many obstacles to those kinds of things um, is also part of the reason why I'm a libertarian. And I don't think it, it can be argued that, you know, the, the, the benefits of reforming licensing regimes would only accrue to the highest IQ, wealthiest people on the planet. Um, it may benefit some of them, um, but I suspect it would benefit a lot of other people as well. Um, and it's the same thing for a lot of the efforts with respect to like criminal justice reform and um, looking at drug policy a little bit differently. The people who would be benefited um, by some of those reforms um, are, again, probably not, um, or at least benefited most, probably not like the wealthiest people um, in society, the most, the, the most brilliant people in society who have all of the options available to them. So you know, freedom can be a, a little bit suspect. I'm not pretending that this is a, a, a magic wand that would uh, obviate all potential problems. Um, but I think relative to all of the available options, it's a pretty damn good one um, and has helped to produce the relative opulence um, that we currently live with. And I, I hope will ensure that we have even more opulence later. I, I mean, I, I'm all for opulence. I want more opulence for myself, <laughs> certainly. Um, where do you come down on the drug thing? Uh, I, I think I went into it. Maybe my, my perspective when I was younger is just legalize it all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't stand between adults and what they want to do. But th that's been challenged. I now I'm confronted with, well, are some of these substances just so chemically powerful that you need a guardrail. You need to make it illegal. Maybe not draconian, but maybe people shouldn't be allowed to smoke meth on the street, to do fentanyl because these substances are too powerful and we might have our own theory of the case as far as what people should be allowed to do, but this is how it works out in reality. Uh, what's your perspective? I, mean, I think a, a concern for civil order is completely legitimate. Um, having someone shooting up in the middle of a sidewalk is suboptimal and probably a problem that we should try to address. address. Um, but whether or not the state should be involved in preventing people from shooting up at all, creating these illegal black markets for drugs, um, I think is another question. And I generally come down on the side of eliminating prohibitions and giving people kind of a maximum degree of freedom. My expectation is that a lot of the very hard, uniquely destructive drugs would perhaps be a lot less attractive to people if they had broader, a broader 
uh, universe of options. But even more than that, I think a lot of the actual injuriousness of really hard drugs isn't from the drugs themselves. It has a lot to do with the ecosystem that people are actually obtaining their drugs in. Like the, uh, Carl Hart, um, is a professor at Columbia who studies a lot of this, is perhaps somewhat controversial, um, refers to them as drug war wounds. Um, these people who will, will take something that is cut with fentanyl um, or laced with some other harmful substance. And as a result, that causes injury to them. You can't know what's in the product if you have no idea who made it. Um, mm. And, you know, in an actual market, you actually have a little bit of recourse. When when alcohol is legal, people are less likely to re, um, drink bathtub gin that might kill them um, and much more likely to go buy something at the grocery store that, you know, will get them a little drunk. Can they do bad things while they're drunk? Undoubtedly. Um, can sugar kill and harm lots of people if they eat too much of it? Yeah. Um, do people eat too much of it? Yeah. Should there be state prohibitions to prevent people from eating too much sugar? I am very skeptical of that proposition. I'm pretty concerned about the unintended consequences of something like that. Yeah, I'm skeptical as well. Um, and to what you're saying, I, I understand it. Although, I mean, I'm just envisioning right now uh, Super Bowl commercials 10 years from now that are combining the sports gambling with the legal meth. And I just uh, I worry. I worry yeah, even yeah. if it's cleaner it. and regu regulated at, at some level. I'm curious about your perspective on the Cold War between a lot of the people in tech uh, and their politics and the uh, surrounding government of San Francisco. You're at Founders Fund, mm -hmm. and it just seems like there's this friction about, th there's this perspective on the issues in San Francisco. I think a lot of, I'm just speaking in generalities, um, the most vocal people in tech who are outspoken on politics blame the government of San Francisco. But I look at it from you know across the Bay and in general, and I think to myself, is there no connection between the industry and what's happening? Is there no connection between an industry that does prioritize uh, making mechanisms of distraction and lo and behold, just by coincidence, a lot of dysfunction happens to be in that exact place. Do you see any connection between, between big tech generally and any sort of societal downside or do you reject that premise? I mean, it is, it is definitely the case and perhaps has always been the case that technology can have profound positive and negative impacts on a society. And, and I think that any truly consequential innovation um, is going to have some pretty profound downside risks. I mean, the printing press literally ignited revolutions and caused yeah. tremendous bloodshed and all sorts of political upheaval all over the world. Um, and I don't think anyone would suggest that it would be better for our species if we never really learned to write and speak and perhaps speak and write and eventually create a printing press. I mean, have those technologies led to bad things? You certainly couldn't yeah. have quote unquote disinformation and misinformation if we couldn't talk to each other, right? Um, yeah. But all told, I think it's a, been a net benefit. Um, and in much the same respects, I think a lot of the technology that's been invented in recent years has been on net, like pretty beneficial to us. Now, are we dealing with some of the, the hangover associated with like, say, social media, for example, and uh, many people's very unhealthy relationship with that, with those platforms? Undoubtedly. Um, will we get better at that over time? I'm optimistic that we can get better at that. And I hope that we will develop the kind of cultural antibodies that are necessary to be able to use Twitter to share these, to share in these common places, um, without it leading to in increasing polarization and enmity being the kind of principal currency on those platforms. Um, you know, a place like Instagram is, is, pretty damn successful and I think far less likely to inspire the kind of vitriol that other platforms are likely to, to inspire. But, you know, are young girls spending too much time there and as a result becoming a bit depressed and thinking about their bodies in different ways? Sure. Um, but kind of cultivating what we need to cultivate in order to coexist with these technologies, um, that, that's, you know, again, like we talked about towards the beginning, the work of lifetimes. I think yeah. it'll take us a little bit of time to, to adjust to that. But I, I don't think that tech is kind of uniquely to blame for, for what's wrong. Um, I think that in a lot of respects, we can, we can only hope 
uh, that we can develop and design new things and create greater prosperity. And I, I might disagree slightly with your uh, characterization that tech is engaged in, you know, developing these tools that uh, distract us. It's certainly true that folks are competing for attention and that people are trying to develop um, technologies and platforms that better able us to to connect with things that resonate with us, sometimes in healthy ways, sometimes in unhealthy ways. Um, but, you know, how we use those things, uh, I think, says more about us oftentimes than it says about the, mm. the technologies themselves. I mean, we could we could use TikTok for much better, um, for much better things than we use it for. Uh, mm. our, our primate brains just seem to be wired in a particular way. I agree. TikTok could probably be used uh, for better purposes than watching underage girls uh, suggestively dance to pop song <laughs> loops. I, I agree with that. Um, I'm more of a techno optimist. I, I have the ambivalence where, you know, on the one hand, you do go, okay, um, we're creating these things faster in our ability to adapt to these things. Mm -hmm. um, that's happening. I can see yeah, it. for sure. But I also subscribe to your more long-term view. I mean, it is true the printing press resulted in just, just these crazy crack-ups and brutal yeah. religious war and... Yeah, in the short term, if you were around back then, you could you would be quite sensible to say, "Hey, this is this is not great. We've opened Pandora's box here. It is bad." Mm -hmm. But long term, reasons for optimism, and I I do think there isn't enough optimism when it comes to the potential that so much of the AI conversation is tilted yeah. towards. It's going to murder us all. Yeah, and what about? maybe we'll be able to live 500 years. That seems yeah. like, a, I don't know. People don't like that sometimes as a possibility. I disagree. I I think that sounds very cool uh, as a potential thing that could happen. But there, who even knows? Uh, yeah. These powerful technologies, it can cut both ways. And if you're going to choose a perspective, I'd rather choose optimism when it comes yeah. to the creation of a powerful tool. Yeah, I mean, if you if you implement the precautionary principle as kind of your principal um, guide for thinking about um, innovation in the future, it's probably not going to lead to great outcomes for you. Um, the reality mm -hmm. is that you can't hope to just stay at the status quo, um, and you can't hope to just redistribute the prosperity that's already been created. Like either one of those pathways, I think, is uh, a road to greater impoverishment and decline. Um, I think you have to always be striving to get to the next rung of the ladder to build something more incredible than what we have today, to be able to grow more food on a smaller plot of land, to make it more pop, pop to make it possible for more people to build families, to live healthy, long lives, um, and to allow as many Einsteins to be born as possible. Um, so that we can we can improve our prospects. I mean that that has to be the goal. I think we have a, a moral obligation, as Kevin Kelly puts it, um, to be optimistic about the future. Um, and I would perhaps add to that a moral obligation to pursue progress in all its various guises. Um, now that doesn't mean that there aren't um, important considerations. As I said earlier, it doesn't mean there aren't risks. Nuclear nuclear. Our, our innovations in the field of nuclear um, technology lead to both bombs um, and potentially limitless clean energy. Um, we got the bombs and we use those. We have some nuclear power plants, but we know collectively that we simply haven't leveraged that technology in the way that we ought to um, out, of, out of fear and precaution mm. and not a, a, a severe enough commitment to trying to address concerns but take advantage of the, the fruits of the insights that we've been able to glean collectively. Yeah, I wonder if the intentionality even matters as far as the outcome, that if we have more of a cultural optimism, we'll get better results or whatever is going to happen is going to happen. But I do wish there was a little bit more of that intentionality and perspective of we could do these great, we could do these great things um, because, you know, scared money don't make money, as yeah. some people say. Just, yeah. uh, you know, you need to open yourself up to possibilities to seize certain possibilities. Um, and you got to in, in, yeah, yeah. inspire Just, people to try, too. I mean, oh, yeah. it, if you if you are 
congenitally pessimistic about things and young people are exposed to a society where all you hear about tech is the things that are scary and bad, um, who would want to work in that field and build something yeah. new? Um, there has to be some stock, a standard level of um, optimism that outshines our, our bleakest uh, nightmare scenarios um, that might overtake us. The doomsday, will it, will it kill us all? I suppose it could, but that hasn't happened yet. So let's work at ensuring that that doesn't happen while also pursuing the very best version of chat GPT imaginable um, so that I can continue to improve uh, as a human and get more done uh, on a daily basis. Will it displace people from jobs? Sure, but we've been there down that road before in some respects. Will it happen faster this time? Will we need some sort of universal basic income? I'm skeptical, but at a minimum, it seems like at least a potential pathway um, that could address people's concerns if they have these concerns. I just wouldn't like to move on that before we actually see that we have to. Well, you mentioned wanting us to have a culture that is more inspiring to people to seize these opportunities. I'm curious as to what you think changes a culture. There's this, um, mm. I don't want to call it a meme or a narrative, but it, there's this evolving thought, especially on the right. It used to be this sense, Andrew Breitbart said that, what was it, the politics is downstream of culture. And now mm -hmm. it seems there's this Christopher Caldwell perspective or uh, Richard Hanania, who I think you guys have had some friction with. You've obviously had some friction with uh, Chris Rufo, and their idea seems to be more that culture is downstream of law, that changing the law creates wokeness or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> do you differ in that perspective markedly? And then if you do, what do you think does cause a vibe shift, as it were? I mean, I think the, without trying to characterize anyone else's um, perspective, I do think that policy can have a, a profound impact on culture um, for, for good and ill. Um, I also believe, perhaps equally as strong, that the unintended consequences of policy tend to be way more profound than anyone appreciates um, beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that the kind of negative um, unintended consequences tend to outweigh the the stated noble uh, aspirations yeah. of those policies, which tend to fall short in really important ways um, of what's going on. And I think, you know, if this seems as though it's in some sort of contrast with my optimism about technology and innovation in that respect, um, and my pessimism about uh, innovation in the public policy sphere, sphere seems different, it's because at least when it comes to technology and business, there's a check. Um, if someone mm. is doing something that is wasteful and counterproductive, they often go out of business um, in the private sector. If someone is doing something that is destructive, wasteful, counterproductive, that's say harming students, um, they may form a union, um, raise their own salaries and make it impossible for them to ever go out of business. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, that's something that we've seen with say like teachers unions, for example, bad public schools tend to not go out of business until they've finished hurting lots and lots of kids for many, many, many years, bad private schools, people stop sending their kids to those. Um, so I think that model matters a lot. And I think that that, that ought to be instructive when it comes to people who imagine that they can engineer society by uh, uh, instituting laws that promote explicitly their vision for what the good society looks like. And the more that I see people who describe themselves as conservative um, turn against the basic values of a free society, like things like free expression, for example, who imagine that that is too great a compromise because people like us aren't as good as messaging about what we ought to be working towards and what the world ought to look like as um, people on the on the political left, perhaps, or even on the extreme political right. Um, I don't I don't share their pessimism. Um, I have mm -hmm. to believe that free expression, that limited government um, is the is the kind of appropriate way to go. Because from my standpoint, even if I were to endorse the perspective that we needed a stronger state and role and say, defining what mora what is moral and what is good and what is just, um, I, I couldn't be sure that the next person who gets elected isn't a terrible, diabolical monster 
who's going mm-hmm. to promote what they decide is moral and just um, at the expense of uh, society broadly. Um, so I'd, I'd much prefer to keep the government generally small um, and to try to transform the culture through the culture, um, not to turn every sort of cultural beef um, into into the the latest um, kind of political showdown. And I, I should say one one last thing about this. I'll try to be succinct. I think a lot of the projects that have aimed to try to reshape the culture in recent years um, have failed pretty profoundly. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about wokeness and certainly the folks you mentioned before um, share a concern about kind of an excess of social justice that I, I, I with me. Um, but my own take is that a lot of the kind of schemes that had been pursued, whether it be banning critical race theory in public schools or trying to pass um, much more controversial kind of transparency legislation, at least as it's called, um, that those gimmicks haven't worked. Uh, they were always bound to fail in my estimation, but even in the places where they're passed, they were passed, you still have the same sort of um, kind of cultural awfulness um, kind of oozing through the culture and finding its way into classrooms. I just don't think prohibitions like that work. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that those schemes haven't worked. Uh, mm. So if that's the case, maybe we should move away from the people who are promoting those kinds of schemes um, and move towards people who are much more interested in trying to build bridges, trying to actually persuade people in a, a kind of traditional way and who imagine that the best, the best out, the best thing that we could pursue is a world where we're not trying to impose our beliefs on other people um, through the the mechanism of the state. Well, the state is weakening in many respects too. I mean, I I anticipate I would ask you a few you questions down the home stretch, but this is just too damn interesting. But I mean, that New Yorker article that was written by Ronan Farrow, which I don't think in perspective was a good article. It was about uh, Elon Musk, but it was fascinating in a way that I don't even think that Farrow understood because Mm. it was very angry at Elon Musk for not helping the U S government with the war in Ukraine. And you would read it and you get from it that Musk's technology is better than our government's and they're Mm -hmm. begging him to bail them out because they're so weak. And you read something like that and it's not even about at that point, whatever your perspective on Musk is or if he's a good guy or a bad guy or whatever. It's, oh my God, there are private actors who have created these technologies that we have just assumed are the province of governments uh, the ability to control the skies, as Ashley Vance has talked mm. about, these these people are coming up with these the, these ways to commandeer space and all the associated technologies, and then that starts to really blow your mind because you're going, we're very much locked into what a bicameral legislature does and this law and that law, and it's all just weakening, and the people involved in it are so old and decrepit, and it just <laughs> seems like. Something else is happening out there that might disrupt it all. I mean, to yeah. use a term that's used in tech maybe too often. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of that forcefully. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Well, we'll ask you uh, one or two you questions and get you out of here for your hard out. Um, you're in all these different places, which is a strange thing uh, because you are different. You're, you're a different person to different people. I'm wondering. You had that really um strong appearance on real time with bill maher did that change your life in any way or is it kind of you know your public perception uh it's mostly anchored by fifth column which isn't even your day job (laughs) yeah i don't know that it changed my life i will say that real time is a very unique um uh, uh, cultural outlet i mean my appearance there is definitely the most consequential single media appearance that i've ever had um, the way people responded to that is just different. Uh, and yeah. I've done a lot of cable news, like a lot of it. Um, and I've done, you know, a little bit of writing and I podcast quite a bit and we don't have a small audience. Um, but that, that was just different. So it's wonderful that something like that exists and that someone like Bill is there to continue to, to be a bit of a, a, a irritant to the culture broadly um, and to kind of pick fights uh, where he sees appropriate and to really embody kind of certain 
ideals that are important to uh, a, a liberal order, a classical liberal order like ours. Um, and, you know, Bill and I don't even agree on everything. I think, especially as we were talking about earlier, like on economic policy and stuff, I imagine there are some strident differences there. Um, but even where we disagree, it's great that an outlet that, like that exists where you can be pretty sure that people from the left and the right are still going to be having conversations about consequential mm. issues and arguing about it in public, which honestly has become a rarity Rare. in yeah. mainstream media. Like mainstream media, I used to do appearances on MSNBC and CNN pretty reliably. Um, and, you know, to have a, a libertarian show up and duke it out with a progressive or a conservative on various issues, it, it's just seemed normal and reasonable. Yeah. And now you flip on MSNBC or CNN and it is not uncommon to see panels of people who vehemently agree on virtually everything. And what they're arguing about is, you know, the degree of awfulness of January 6th. How close to kind of the collapse of government did we come on that day? The degree of awfulness of Donald Trump. Like, how terrible is he? Is he actually Hitler, Mao, or Stalin? Which is it? Um, and he may be terrible. And in general, I hate all politicians. So fine, I'll accept that he's terrible. But if you're being sensationalist, if you're engaged in hysteria, it's important. And if no one on set recognizes that you guys might be wrong about your assessment in some in some important way, I think that's a problem too. Um, and it makes the product much worse, and it makes you likely to make errors, often systematic errors that only flow in one direction. And it's easy to stop trusting people like that, and hence your crisis in media. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, it, there is an epistemological crisis certainly, and I do think it is easy to dismiss it as entertainment or TV or podcast, but I do think real time is one of the few places where you can watch people duke it out. Yeah. That's a valuable position in the culture. Fifth column is also such a place where you guys will we have try. arguments. Uh, Camille Foster, everybody, uh, just a font of wisdom and thoughtful provocation. Thanks so much for doing this, man. Thank you, Ethan. I'm a, I'm a huge fan and I hope you uh, will come back on the podcast soon. Oh, whenever you guys invite me, I'm there. Thanks so All much, right. man. Later.